God is so good today. I don't have very much to say. We've got to get situated a little bit. Let's see, what, let's see what the Lord does today. They said it was, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go in the house of God. I was Amen. glad today. Amen. David is, is, uh, has this encounter, he's had an encounter with the son Absalom, and it doesn't stop him, no matter kind of what came against him, he says, you know, bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth, he said, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord, the humble shall make her up and be glad, and so I'm just glad today, no matter what comes our way, we can give God glory and honor, and we can just worship him, you know. uh, I hope not to bore you tonight, uh, there was a preacher who got up and gave his text, it was out of Genesis chapter 4, I think it's like verse 16 or something, and it says that Cain got up and he left the presence of God and went into the land of Nod, and he looked up and so did his congregation, they had all gone to Nod, and they were all sleeping on him, and so I hope I don't, I hope I don't do that to y'all tonight, uh, may happen if it does, somebody just get up and take a laugh and just, Jesus, and we'll see what happens, maybe everybody will wake up, uh, but if we can, I'd like to take my text from uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verse 13. And just say amen when you're ready. The word of the Lord reads, For my people have committed two evils. Uh, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Uh, Brother Walker, if you would just say a word. Amen. Uh, throughout history, we have uh, there are such things as philosophies and ideas, and philosophies are kind of really just some philosophy, just crazy ideas. People just kind of sit around and just think stuff. And uh, some of the ancient philosophers were known for doing that. They kind of get together in groups and just sit there and think. Uh, they would think some crazy things. Some people think so much and they look at their arms and they don't know if their arms exist as extensions of the mind. They just, I don't know if I can really, this is there. And some people uh, think and they, they get to the place where, I know I exist and I'm thinking, and, but I don't know if Sister Waldron exists. Uh, and they get to a place where they just think things and it's kind of crazy some of the ideas they come up with and uh, they think away all these things and uh, throughout philosophy there were uh, different uh, sections of philosophers, I guess you could say different categories. You have during time you have the pre-Socratics, uh, this included a, a lot of people actually. Um, uh, you had Plato and Aristotle. Plato kind of really used uh, Socrates and all these uh, other philosophers. He kind of used them in dialogues and stuff like that and you have uh, post Aristotelians, which are just one of those big words for uh, Aristotle. People just kind of use big words for no reason. Uh, then you have the medieval uh, philosophers and the modern, and then where we're at today, what most would say the postmodern philosophers. And uh, a part of today's philosophies, you have uh, different people, like uh, you have <clears throat> Christopher Hitchens, who is a guy who wrote a book uh, titled God is Not Great. You have people like Richard Dawkins who wrote a book called The God Delusion. Uh, in their books, they do everything they can, kind of just, they don't believe in God. Uh, uh, Richard Dawkins says something to the effect of, uh, God is, you know, I don't want to serve this jealous kind of person who, who gets jealous when these people flirt with, with another God, a rival God. Uh, and so he has all these crazy ideas about, about science, and some of them are just flat out untrue, you can prove them easily to be untrue, and uh, he recognizes certain things about there being a creator in our lives, but uh, in his books he kind of takes a nasty tone and says there's no such thing. Uh, and so going back, they were influenced by other people like uh, Bertrand Russell, who is another philosopher, and he didn't believe in a God, and he kind of paints God as being this something that, you know, you don't really need this thing, it's not, he's not really there. Uh, and so you go back further and you follow the progression of these people and uh, they all kind of fall in line and it progresses. Uh, from the beginning, they, they may have had some kind of belief in a God. Some of them believed that they were gods. Some of them believed in a God or gods, but we couldn't know him. We couldn't touch him. He couldn't touch us. If we prayed, it was, it was kind of to no effect. 
uh, and it started to make its way into certain church circles and certain people began to uh, adopt these ideas and uh, there was one philosopher early uh, 19, I believe it was from 1800 to 1900 uh, and he had the idea that God is dead and we killed him with our ideas. His name was Frid uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and he said that, you know, God is dead. He wrote a book, a little, uh, a little mini uh, article about it. And he said there's a madman who had a torch and he lit it. He runs into a city and he says in the city, he's like, where is God? And he's looking for a God and he says uh, there, there are people who are starting to laugh and make fun of him. And he said, you know, did I lose him? Did, did, God, did we lose God? He said, uh, maybe he's gone on a voyage. Maybe he's far away. We just, he just can't hear us today. And so he's got all these, he's all, all these uh, questions, and then the people are just laughing at him. This guy's crazy, you know. And uh, he finally stops and says, no, I'm going to tell you what you did. We, we killed him with, with our, basically with our philosophies. We killed him. Uh, and so the, he, he kind of says, you know, we, who gave us the power to, the sponge to kind of wipe away the horizon? And so he's recognizing that, that, you know, we with our ideas, these, this, these thinking outside of the scripture, we think outside of the scripture, and when we do that without the word of God, without God, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And so he believed, and he was, he was right, if we, if we do away with God in our lives, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And some people uh, buy these ideas, uh, some people pick up on these ideas. Uh, in, in the church, and it started somewhat with Thomas Aquinas, a guy in far back, far, far long ago, long time, time where I can't even uh, imagine, where he believed that it was okay to pick up on these philosophies and scripture. And so he had these two uh, kind of understandings, and so that kind of made its way into the church, and the church picked up some of these ideas, and you have different churches who believe different things because They've divorced themselves from Scripture, and now it's okay to kind of believe what you want. And so uh, Jeremiah here is writing to the people of God, and this is this is far before that. This, Jeremiah is writing to the people of God, and these people are they're yet to go into a bondage, but Jeremiah is prophesying that this is going to happen because you've forsaken God. God is speaking to Jeremiah here, and he says, "For my people have committed two evils. There are two things. Number one, they forsook God as the fountain of." of living water, and two, they heat cisterns out, broken cisterns. And these cisterns, cisterns, what they are, they're kind of like, a, I don't want to say a pot, but they're kind of like these little tanks that would hold water, and they would go into the mountains and they'd carve out, uh, carve out little paths for the water to flow through, and the water would come down and it uh, make its way from the rain into the, the cistern. And so when they had needed water, when there was no water from the spring, they would have this water that was ready on supply, but the thing about cisterns is the, the water would go stagnant. They would have, with their ideas, they, they hewed out this whole path. And some of these philosophers have done that. They hew, they've made these paths for their ideas. But when it comes down to it, the thing that holds them, holds all that they need, goes stagnant. And so they have no real truth, no real substance. They have no real hope. Uh, all of these people kind of come to the place where they believe, and in the modern times especially, uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, they didn't believe in a, a future. They believed that man was here, and man died, and man was no more. Whereas the scripture teaches us that God has, has given us a time, we have our time on earth to, to get things right, get things together, and when at the end of our lives, there are two destinations. You can go to heaven, or you can go somewhere where it's not very comfortable. <laughs> Uh, so, God has given us these, and he's laid out in his word a plan of salvation. And there, there, there's a woman in the uh, in book of John, chapter 4, and it's interesting that God says they forsook him as a fountain, fountain of living water. Because in John, chapter 4, there's a woman who goes to the well, and she's drawing out water to, to fill up her bucket. And she's getting ready, and Jesus asks her, he says, hey, can you give me some water? And this lady, she's... She's like, how can you talk to me? You know, we don't have this interaction. It's socially un un unright for us to talk to each other. There's, there's no engagement here. And uh, so Jesus looks at her and he says, if you knew who I was and the gift of God, you would ask me for water because I can give you water that would make you, uh, you would not thirst again. And the scripture says to the effect of this, he says in verse 10 of John chapter 4, 
He says, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given me living water. Because God became a man, so that way he can give us that living water. Uh, we don't, sometimes we kind of stop short, and I was reading and studying some, uh, and in this passage, there are some people who, who would read that and they kind of brush over, oh, there was a such thing as a, a living water, it's a fresh spring, you know. Jesus is talking about his religion and his ideas, and he has that, but Jesus went further than that. Uh, they kind of divorce this scripture, and they want to use their ideas, and they don't accompany it with uh, John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, uh, in the last day, that great day, the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Verse 38 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 says, But this spoke he of the Holy Spirit, uh, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so Jesus went further to say, he, he explained that, uh, this is not just uh, an idea. It's not just a religion. There are people out here who have ideas. They have given themselves religions. And God in, in Jeremiah chapter 2 is talking about these people who are going into idolatry and serving these other gods and buying into these other religious systems, these ideas that can't really hold water. It's kind of these ideas where you don't get any substance, you don't get any, the water is important for the, the body to, to have and for the human, we need this water. We need this living water to get out of what we're in. And so Jesus uh, here is, is telling us that for you to have this, this living water, there's something that you've got to do. This living water is here to kind of take you out of what you were in, and there's a world that we're in, and there are kind of crazy stuff that goes on in this world. Today there was attacks in, uh, at the UK Parliament, and there are people that are dying, and we have different things in this world. Albany in January, I believe it was the 2nd, and January 22nd, there was tornadoes that came through and destruction, and we have all these kind of crazy things, and in our world there are crazy things, and we can't control it, and we need some kind of hope, and the Bible describes the Holy Ghost as Christ in you, the hope of glory, because while these people uh, divorce themselves from God, and they divorce themselves from hope, they have no end, and they say, you know, you live your life, and you die, and well, that's it, you don't go anywhere, you're, you're dead, you cease to exist. Uh, the Bible has always shown us that there is a place for you to go and the only way you can get to heaven Jesus says in the chapter right before John chapter 4 says, except a man be born of water and of spirit you cannot see or into the kingdom of God and so we've got to be born again as, as Jesus described and a part of this process is being born of the spirit the evidence is speaking in tongues and so in order to have that living water living inside of you you got to believe. you got to be born again. And in this process, God takes you out of that stuff that we were in, that old world, and he starts to, starts to work in you, and you see a change in your life, and you see a difference in the way you interact with people, and it's, it's God working in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, and in the end, God will come back for his people, and, and we'll be the people of God, and he'll take us out of here, and we'll go to a place where it's, it's not like this world. It's far greater, and we'll have hope, and we'll be joy, and worship God and be able to live life outside of sin. And it's God working and God doing something because he has an end goal for his people. Uh, God came and he died on a cross. Uh, but this wasn't just because he, you know, it wasn't just because he was like, well, look what I can do. I can just, you know, I can make myself a man and I can do this and I can do that and I can show up this person, I can show up this person. But he came because uh, first or Second Corinthians chapter five verse nineteen says is to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. It was so that He can bring us to Him. It was so that way everyone in the world can taste and see that the Lord is good because God has given us a way out of this world. He can move in situations where we don't know He was there, and God can do uh, something that we didn't think was possible. Uh, so. In our world, we, we face difficulties and we face uh, struggles and different things like that. And there are ideas that, that come against us and there are people who may uh, believe that it doesn't matter. And as Frederick Nietzsche said, it was with if you divorce yourself from, from God and 
uh, to take that a step farther, if you divorce yourself from the truth of God's scripture and viewing that as absolute truth, where all the answers of life come from, you will end up in a place where there are no absolutes. And there are people who, we went out knocking doors and we had people tell us, you know, it doesn't really matter where, you, where you're at, it, you know, just go where you want, you know, kind of do what you want. And there are people we asked if they'd like prayer and said, well, you know, no, nah, I don't really need that stuff. It's, it's not really that important. But it always is important because God is the only one that can change the situation. God is the only one that can move on our behalf. And God is the only one that can do the impossible in our lives. Amen. Uh, there were people uh, in these times that were philosophers that, that Paul account, uh, encountered in, in uh, Acts chapter 17. They were the, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Uh, these people were kind of these uh, polytheistic people and they believed that, you know, you can have as many gods as you want, really. And then one group, the Epicureans, didn't really believe that it mattered because it doesn't matter how much you pray. God can't hear you. He's not going to He's not gonna do anything for you. Uh, and so Paul comes up to them and he sees that they have all these idols and these, these uh, he's, it's described as a city wholly given to idolatry. And Paul goes in and he starts to uh, discuss things with them. And he says, I would like to show you about this unknown God. This God that you don't know. This God that you have not encountered yet. The only God that will be present in your situation. When you call on that name of Jesus, he will be there to meet your need. When you are down and out, when you don't know what's going on in your life, God can move and you can just call on that name and be present. Never present help in a time of need. And so Paul starts to describe in this, this unknown God that they didn't know. Maybe all of these other gods, they, they might have had ideas about them. They may have been able to dissect them. And Paul kind of goes on and quotes some people that they use. And he says, you know, this is the one that's true. And he says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your poets said. Uh, and so he, he's talking to these people. And you, they may know their gods. And they may know something about their religion. And there may be churches down the street. They may know what they believe, but that doesn't make it right. Uh, the only God that can answer your situation is that God that came down from heaven and manifested himself in flesh. That God who died on the cross for my sins. That God who was personal enough to come down and interact with us. And the same God who came back as the Holy Ghost. So he can fill us and give us that fountain of living water. Set out of your belly. And so that's where we lie. Our hope lies in him. We have no hope outside of him because outside of him we are divorced from all absolutes and we live lives where it's okay for me to do what I want. It's okay for me to go where I want because, because I don't have ties to a God who tells me, you can't do that. But why can't I do that? It's not just an empty cry of just don't do that. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to have fun. I don't want you to do this. And I don't want you to do that. It's not just rules and regulations, but God is doing this because there's a purpose. If I go out and do what I want, if I go out and start acting the way I want, if I go out and I start murdering everybody, it may be okay in, in some of these people's eyes, uh, but it's not okay in God's eyes. But why? Why is that important? Uh, when you adopt these ideas of, of no God and, and no absolutes, uh, this is what Adolf Hitler picked up on. Uh, Hitler uh, was influenced by uh, this Nietzsche. Uh, and he, he was also influenced by, by other people like Charles Darwin and other people who kind of divorced themselves from God. They started off and they understood, well, you know, there might be a God, there is a God. Uh, but throughout their, their life and without scripture, they, they closed the Bible in their life and they just kind of walked down a path and said, there is no God, you know, I can live my life the way I want without a God. There will be no more absolutes for me to live by, and I can do what I want. And Hitler said, okay, well, I'm going to do what I want. And so he went and he started, you know, building his empire, and he started killing off people, and the world kind of just grew and was like, this isn't right. And on his trials, uh, through the Nuremberg trials, uh, one of the men that were there looked at another man and asked him, he said, he looked and said, you know what you're doing is wrong. And the guy, you know what you're doing is wrong because there's something in you, no matter how far you get away from the scripture, no matter how far you try and get away from God, there's something in you that God created us with, a conscience that says, this is wrong and I can't live the way I want to live because if I live the way I want to live, there are repercussions and there are people that get hurt and there are things that die in the process. And so they live their lives the way they want and they do exactly what they want because they don't want a God, but they don't understand that God isn't just making these boundaries for them not to cross them. He's not just saying, look, 
I want you to stay over there in a little box. And I don't want you to get out of that box. Because if you get out of that box, you might experience something. You might have some fun. God's not doing that. He's doing it because there are some things that he's protecting us and he's keeping us and he's trying to get us to that expected end where we're supposed to go. He's trying to get us to that place where we can live a life of freedom and we can live a, with true happiness and we can be face to face with him. And in our lives, we, we may feel like it doesn't matter, you know, it may not matter to us what church we go to. It may not matter to us where, you know, where we, where we go to kind of get our ideas from. But not every church believes in the scripture. And not every person follows the Bible. And we've got to make sure that we, we uh, get ourselves completely and anchored to the, to the word of God and to, to a church and a pastor like Pastor Waldron who, who believes the truth of the scripture, who believes the Bible to be in and found the word of God, who believes that everything in the Bible is truth from God because that's what it is. Amen. We've got to make sure that we don't take ourselves out of the presence of God Amen. and walk away, walk to this path of ideas, hew out cisterns for ourselves and and build these ideas and these, these ways for us to live. And just to get to the end of it and find out, you know, like, there's stagnant water in there and I can't drink that. When it gets down to it, you, where do I go from here? Uh, I have no hope and no end in sight. You know, I live and I die and goodbye, that's it. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we connect ourselves to the truth of God's word. We've got to make sure that we connect ourselves to the Holy Ghost and that we live our lives truth. Uh, in seeking the will of God for our lives. Amen. 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 God bless.